I think one of the keys to a really great life and a really successful life is how we meet problems. And I learned over time, and you may have noticed this too, that sometimes if I'm encountering a problem, it can kind of take me in. I can get myopic in it. It can seem insurmountable. And then I actually just step back, take some space, and then something, something happens. And maybe it's... It means that there's some, some space for grace or something like magic, but that something happens when you take space and you let go. And some, sometimes even the shape of the problem changes. So I noticed this many times in my life, but a, a momentous one was when I was 26 years old and I was invited by this friend to go for a hike. And this was, this was a pretty big hike. It was a 14,000 foot mountain, which, um, if you've never done that, it, it takes something. And I thought, okay, I've been having this challenge or this problem of feeling really weak in my body and in my life, and I'm gonna go do this. I can do this three hour hike and I can learn something about myself and it's gonna make me stronger because I wanna be stronger. So I, I take off to go do this hike. And we start off, we've got a three hour hike in front of us, a little trail mix and some water, and we start going, and it's a, it's a cloudy day, and we get to the top of the mountain and we take a selfie that it's before smartphones, so it's one of those throwaway cameras, you know. And they're like, okay, we're doing good, and then we go on the ridge. We didn't realize that there was more than one ridge. So what was supposed to be a three-hour hike ended up being a 20-hour hike. I got back to my truck at 6 the next morning. But when I was up on this razor-sharp mountain ridge that I'm not supposed to be on without ropes, I didn't know until later because it was the wrong ridge, when I'm up on this ridge, if you'd have told me I was gonna hike another 18 hours without taking a break in blizzard and winter conditions before I would get back to my truck the next morning, I, I, I didn't think I could do that, right? I wouldn't have thought that I could actually do that and I probably would have died like another man did die that night in the same area on a mountain in that blizzard. And Thank God I didn't know I was lost, <laughs> so I was able to figure it out and just keep going. Thank God I didn't know I had to do that. And what happened was at the other end of that, I thought, oh, I thought the problem was that I wasn't strong. But I'm actually much stronger than I realized in my body and in my heart and in my mind. And the problem was actually that my belief system was wrong. And that's what I find again and again when I look at problems, that we have these problems in our lives and we're so in them, and it's actually the beliefs. There's that Einstein quote that we all know, right? That the mind that created the problem is, is not the same mind that's going to solve the problem, right? This mindset. So, so when we look at these bigger problems in the world, I wonder where we can actually step back. I wonder where we can actually take some space and make room for that, how we can actually open up our minds and let go and let some solutions come in. So this happened uh, a few years ago. The co-founders of, of the company that I run, uh, two of my co-founders came together and they were trying to figure out this problem of space communications. So space communications, there are a couple different realms of space communications. Uh, there's the close to Earth, the close to Earth stuff. So we've got these, these closer to Earth orbits and the outer one is called GEO and it's around 40,000 kilometers from the surface and inward. So from that part on in, from 40,000 kilometers on in, we've got pretty fast communication. So if you've ever used a GPS, most of us these days have. If you use cell phones, if you use satellite TV, all those signals are pretty fast, pretty strong. They're going into space and coming back. It's amazing. But for some reason, past that geo, past that outer ring of what we call Earth local at our company, once you get past that, it's, it's actually the same communication has been being used for about 60 years. So it's, it's great. It has made possible things such as moon landings. It has made possible things such as all these incredible spacecraft going out and discovering things. And we spend hundreds of millions of dollars to send these spacecraft out into space. And then we have to choose 
they have to choose what fraction of that they want to send back down to Earth, what fraction of the data that they're collecting they want to send back down to Earth, and then they come back to these big antennas, and, and then they have to wait. And then they have a 28 megabits per second shared trunk line, which means basically that there's this tiny little, tiny little data stream that they're all kind of fighting for to get access. So what happens is that over time, this has worked. We spent billions of dollars building this network around the Earth, and it works. But we're getting to the point where it's becoming a bottleneck. Whereas now more and more people want to go to the moon. We want to go back to the moon. We want to actually put feet on the moon again. We want to put a woman's feet on the moon, which is, I think, a great thing. <laughs> and we want to learn more about space. And in order to do that, we actually need more communication capacity than what we have right now. So these two men, my two co-founders, incredible men that they are, in a non-work conversation, took some space from what they were doing, had an informal dialogue, and together figured out, oh my gosh, that we've been designing this whole communication structure as if it was pre-Copernicus, you know, designing it as if it's Earth-centric. And we need to pull this not only off the planet, but actually design it around the solar system and make it solar system-centric to change in perspective. So they figured that out, and then through this, They've been able to create 24-7, high volume and high velocity data for near Earth and deep space. What does that mean? What does it mean if suddenly we can actually scale to the demands of space? It means that we can have all the communication we want to go into space. So what that means is that other countries can go to space. That means that NASA can do more things in space than what the, the DSN, which is the current system, allows. That means that commercial space providers can do stuff in space. And that's exciting when you think about the next frontier for humanity. We've done a pretty good job of exploring this planet. We've actually tapped this planet of a lot of resources. We've done a lot of things here on Earth. What are we going to do out there? You know, one thing we're going to do out there is we're going to start pulling some minerals from asteroids. We're going to start pulling metals from asteroids instead of the Earth. And that's, that's good, because you know this is a finite resource. <laughs> so th there's some advantage there. That's amazing. What's another thing we're going to do in space? We're going to be able to go out there and learn more science. So instead of, like I said, getting these little bits of scientific knowledge that we've been able to send back, we're going to be able to send back a lot more. It's going to open the door for that. And it's, it's amazing what we're learning. I mean, I remember being in college. This is going to date me. I remember being in college and being told that there were 100 galaxies in the universe. <laughs> you might know that there are a lot more than that these days because we keep learning. Because there's so much we don't know, and space holds so much of that, and it's beautiful, actually. And then this idea of colonizing, right? Like we might live, we might not just put more human feet on the moon, but we might live on the moon. We might live on Mars. What does that make possible? I don't even know. Right, this opens doors and changes perspectives to everything that we're doing. What I think is really important here is that it's not just changing perspectives for the people that are going, but that humanity is changing right now because space is opening up. But another thing that's happening with space opening up is that we also, at the same time, are facing global challenges and species-wide challenges that we've never faced before. And this comes back to my original point of how are we actually addressing problems and how can we address them in a way that really works. So there's this, there's this problem, there's this global problem or challenge or threat that not a lot of people are talking about, but I bet some people in this room know about. Um, and it's called space weather. Now, they call it space weather, but it's actually all originating from the sun. So every, every now and then the sun, we all know about solar flares, right? The solar flares come, they create beautiful northern lights. If you're lucky, you get to go see them. Sometimes there's radiation. You might, every now and then, catch a news story where um, a transformer is blowing, like blows because of a solar flare because it's so much electricity and radiation. OK, that's a big deal. So in 1859, there was something called the Carrington event. 
And this is something that happens periodically over history, about every 150 years or so. And the Carrington event is the first time that this thing happened when we had electricity on the ground. So the thing that happens is something called a coronal mass ejection, or a CME. It comes from the center of the sun, and it blows out the side. And then one happens, and it blows through the sun's atmosphere. And then if it happens to go in the direction of the Earth, then it goes through the Earth's atmosphere and blows, you know, kind of burns through that. And then whatever radiation and electricity is, hasn't been stopped by those two atmospheres comes through, and the Earth is impacted. And we get that. That happens sometimes. But every now and then, as in the case of the Carrington event, two of those happen back to back in the same direction. And when that happens, and that second one comes through, and both atmospheres have just been cleared by the first one, so then it's just a lot of radiation and electricity coming through. So in 1859, this happened. And for the first time, we had something of an electrical grid, or the beginnings of it. We had telegraph machines, and they blew up some of them. Some of them didn't. Some of them, people unplugged, and the telegraph machines continued to send signals, even though they were unplugged. That's how much electricity is in the air, right? That's kind of amazing. So if you're doing math, and I said this happens around every 150 years, it's been 160 years. So this isn't an if thing, it's a when, right? So this is, this is what happened in 2012. In 2012, which was supposed to be the end of the Mayan calendar, right? In 2012, yeah. <laughs> One of these events happened, but look, the Earth was on the wrong side. <laughs> or the right side, let's, let's be clear. <laughs> the Earth was on the right side to not be hit by this. That you see those big things spewing out of the sun. This is actually what happened in 2012, and we missed it, I believe, by around 12 hours. So, you know, thank God. <laughs> and at some point, it's going to come. So this is... This is one of those things where we've got a major problem and there's something, what are, what are we going to do with that, right? So my two co-founders created this space communications platform, not just because it opens up the frontiers of space, and that's very sexy. I mean, who doesn't want to do more cool stuff in space, right? But also because one of the biggest near-term threats to civilization is space weather. And in order for us to deal with this, we actually need to do a couple of things. One of them is prediction. We haven't had enough really good, reliable, high capacity data flowing from deep space to actually um, get good information from the sun. We get, we get like a snapshot of the sun and then another snapshot and then another snapshot. And these scientists that are working on this are doing incredible things with that. I mean, I'm blown away by what I have seen happen with that. And now we've got the in a couple of years, once we launch this, <laughs> we're going to have the capacity to actually really study the sun. Because right now, we've got less than a day's notice if one of these events happens. But we think we can get up to two weeks. And if we can get two weeks of prediction, that does something. right? That helps prepare us, because this is the world. Another thing that it can do is actually help our satellites to be more responsive. But let's, let's actually backtrack here for a second and talk about, so what happens if this were to hit today? If this were to hit today, it takes out a Carrington level event, it will take out the grid for about four to six years. Those are the rough estimates. So this is this is a big deal, right? It's not just a loss of lights, right? It's it's a loss of food. So we, we don't have cell phones, we don't have gas to truck things, because gas stations now are all dependent on electricity, right? Um, we don't have we don't have the cooling systems on nuclear reactors. We don't have hospitals. We don't have pharmacies. It's a big deal, right? This is actually, this is one of those things you don't want to think about. And we believe in, in our company and the reason we're creating this deep space communications platform, and we believe that we can get prediction here, but we also believe that we can come together as humanity, that we can take some space that we can look at this together, we believe there's a way that we can figure out how to actually collect and harness this energy. So that instead of this being a world-ending or civilization-ending event, 
that this can actually be a boon, that we can actually collect this energy and use it to fuel on or off-planet endeavors. And this is not the only near-term threat that we're facing. So how do we change these threats and problems to opportunities? And I would say that one of the biggest things that we can do is we can do this together. It's really easy for us to go in our lives and, and yes, live your life and do beautiful things in your life. And what we can do is we can actually connect with each other. And we cannot leave it in the hands of the few people, the few people that are watching for asteroids to hit our planet right now, that are volunteers. <laughs> leave it to the few amazing, brilliant scientists that are studying the sun and looking at space weather and trying to predict this. We need to bring our different kinds of geniuses together and we need to bring our hearts and our voices. When we look at these global challenges, so one thing we can do is we can go to space. We can get a new perspective. That's going to help. Like there's definitely something there. And as some of our species are going out there and they're having this experience of seeing this precious world, which there have been all these reports of this. Astronauts go to space and they see the world and they're like, oh. Like suddenly sustainability means something different when you see the planet so tiny and glowing like this little blue marble. And then when all of your air and your water and your safety is in this tiny little spacecraft, all of a sudden that world looks a lot more precious. And we can do that. So as, as we're sending more astronauts, as we're sending tourists into space, yes, we're going to get new perspectives. And that's going to help. But the other thing we can do is come together and bring our genius. I think the genius of farmers needs to come together with the genius of teachers needs to come together with the genius of scientists, business leaders, artists. We need to bring together our ways of seeing things to solve the biggest challenges in the world. It's not about isolated people solving the things because this is our problem and it's our opportunity to come together. It's our opportunity to actually bring our voices, bring our care, and address the biggest global challenges that are facing us. And I think we can do it together. Thank you.